Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. Your co-host, Rich Gear here as well. And we're going to talk about the geologic evidence for the flood. We haven't talked about the flood in quite a while, Doug. It's, uh, and it's kind of nice to revisit it because geology is really one of your strong suits, I think. Really a, one of your, uh, the bailiwick of well, your, uh, you besides know, I, chemistry. I, for, for a while I wasn't thinking that, well, that was really qualified to, uh, to, as well as a lot of the other guys that I uh, associate with. But I, after, uh, you know, we've done a lot of these adventures where we've gone out and seen a lot of this stuff and uh, firsthand looked at uh, the problems that uh, come up with concerning the uh, evolutionary timeline uh, that you find in geology. Right. And uh, I'm uh, working on a book right now. I don't know when it's going to be out. Uh, it's called uh, "Don't Let Your Geology Mess Up Your Theology." Yeah, that good old, good old statement. You came up with that quite a number of years ago, and yeah, you know, it's going to be a book now. Uh, for a long time, I've had that in my mind to uh, to write that book, and I I was wondering if I really had the qualifications to do so. There's a lot of people with PhDs, but what I'm doing is doing it more from a perspective of. Um, uh, here's here's the evidence, uh, and it's uh, pretty much plain to see uh, when when you go out and see it. And then the, here are some of the places you can actually travel to right. to find uh, find this uh, these type of things. And this is what you need to look for. And uh, oftentimes the uh, the things that you need to look for are the things that the evolutionists don't want to see because uh, it conflicts with their uh, paradigm. And so um, I'm. I'm starting out the book a little bit talking about uh, the political climate that happened around the turn of the uh, of the 19th century and the last of the 18th century, where the people were trying to throw off the divine right of kings, and yeah. because of that, uh, they were looking for ways to justify that. And the one way was to discredit the authority of the Bible. And why? And why is that so critical? Because. Um, like the whole idea of the divine right of kings mm -hmm. was the idea that God was the ultimate authority mm -hmm. and he delegated it to kings and rulers and therefore you had to be submissive to that and this is from the the, the biblical text uh, of, you know God is the ultimate authority by the way we in the United States never have any we've never we, we look at that and say what the heck is that, that is that even a thing but it was very yeah, right. strong, apparently, in the in the in the medieval age and throughout the age of of of, of humankind, for the most part, we had kings and, and queens and rulers, and it was just kind of accepted. But they were trying to base their their uh, theology, if you will, or their belief system on a biblical text. And so the way these people felt to get to get rid of the divine right of kings, they had to get rid of the Bible. Right, and that's but, what happened. But if you read the Bible and you look at all the different kings that were in the Bible, <laughs> well, there were very few of them that were, were very uh, good. Yeah, were yeah. Any good, you know, especially all of the ones that were the Israelite kings, none of them were good. In fact, the real thing seems to be that when when uh, they threw God off because they wanted a king like all the other nations, right. God was not really happy with it, but he he, he let them have it. And uh, yeah, Israel had uh, no good kings. <laughs> Judah had a few good ones, but mostly bad mm -hmm. ones as well. And ultimately, they both fell down. Mm -hmm. I noticed too, Doug, that you know, but God does use people to disseminate stuff He wants to wants to have. He had judges at one time, Moses, and then you had had all kinds mm -hmm. of Gideon and and uh, and Jehoshaphat and all these guys. But they were not rulers in that sense. They would dispense the the rule of God. And one thing I noticed was very interesting about it. You did not automatically become a judge because you were descended from a judge. Mm. In fact, Moses' son never became a judge. Shoot, and then you go down to Eli, his sons were corrupt. And even Samuel, his sons were not very good either. That's why they got, but none of them really was in here. But kings, it's a different deal. By right, by divine right. But it's not divine right. It's yeah, human right. It's human usurping what God's thing is. Now, what does that got to do with the geologic stuff, Doug? Yeah, Doug? No, no, you were getting way off of field. Well, there. we're going back on field. Okay, <laughs> a, okay what we're doing uh, right now is I'm going to sort of boom, 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 uh, with like a barrage, which is a, a good debate uh, technique. Uh, 
Which, Fair uh, enough. But uh, it's uh, something where we're going to overload you with a number of different things for you to th consider. So write them down and um, and uh, investigate to see if we're uh, right on track with a lot of these things. And one of the things I want to just think, because the whole thing went in the weeds there for a little while was because the first thing that they tried to destroy was the geology. Exactly. That's okay. what happened is that Lyell, Hutton, and... Uh, uh, William Smith and a few other folks like that they really, yeah. weren't um, all that hot on uh, on having the and this began term. before evolution actually came into the picture right and this was this was the the, the, this the, is kind what of the inspired mr. Darwin yes. and, and he read the uh, Lyell's uh, Principles of Geology while on the Beagle. Yep, written in 1830, I think that's when it came out. Yep. And, and so uh, these types of things is what uh, got us started, and now uh, what we have, uh, there, there are a bunch of different things that we've discovered as creationists that uh, really point out that there was indeed a global flood. Yes, and by the way, that's, that's the second point, is because the geology wanted to establish long ages mm -hmm. which basically destroyed the chronology and gene genealogy of the biblical text this is the whole underpinning of the whole deal they want to get rid of all of it and so then we as who believe the biblical text mm -hmm. so well well what is does the evidence or anything around does it corroborate a biblical text and we think that's a fair fair thing to look at and we think it actually does and you're going to go through these okay. so why don't you go through them Doug right now okay what I uh, I'll first lay another foundation okay and that is the, <laughs> uh, the uh, creationist perspective that we have right about now and that has to do with catastrophic plate tectonics uh, explaining why we have uh, the continents looking like they do yes because we believe that uh, the, the, the start of the flood uh, occurred at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Yeah. Now, this was some distance away from where the ark was. Yes. But, but uh, it started to sp split the continents, and they actually split at a rapid rate versus a um, uh, inch by inch like the evolutionists believe. Yeah, I suppose the graduate. Everyone believes in plate tectonics to some extent, but the long agers, the evolutionists, and I believe in uh, long term plate tectonics or you know long age. Uh, biblical thing it happened catastrophically very quickly. And uh, what you see is um, the mountain building uh, taking place, uh, like uh, at the Appalachians first, and then at the, where the uh, Rocky Mountains occur, where you have it all folded up, uh, and you cannot, in my mind, have that occur unless there's a lot of momentum uh, with, with uh, the traveling of the of the continents, and so uh, it uh, created this the splitting apart of the continents, and you can see where the Earth has been ripped apart and down the middle of the Mid Atlantic Ridge, uh, and. And so, actually, what happened was that when, uh, as the floods uh, continued, it started piling all the sediment uh, over where the, the, the North America is and, uh, and on Europe, because it was uh, roiling out like yep. this, and spewing so out. It, it spewing out, and then it um, uh, then uh, then actually what happened was that the. Uh, the continent here sort of shifted like this, uh, so the mountains rose and the valleys sank. Down according to Psalms, yep. According to Psalm, and uh, and you have uh, most of the, uh, the sedimentary rocks are on the continents, mm -hmm. but in the, in the ba ocean basins, it's basalt, it's uh, volcanic, and so that's what you have uh, uh, as a foundation. Uh, of where we're coming from. Now, these mm, the theories uh, are still under flux. We're uh, working on them. But uh, here's some of the evidence that we find uh, that uh, uh, sort of backs us up. Yep. The first one, and this is what caught my eye years and years ago, is yeah. uh, overthrusts. And overthrusts are where uh, you have the, the geologic sequence out of order. Uh, a perfect example of that is Glacier National Park, where you have uh, rocks out of order, but it's about 50 miles from the east to the west, and 350 miles from the north to the south. This is the Lewis overthrust? Lewis overthrust. Okay, in, in Montana. And if you go to Montana today, there is a 
A perfect example of this is Chief Mountain. Chief Mountain is what they call a clip, K-L-I-P-P-E. And the clip is uh, where you have a block of Precambrian rock and all around it you see the Cretaceous rock underneath it. Yeah. Uh, Precambrian on Cretaceous is not in the order that evolutionists expect. Precambrian is supposed to be on the bottom, not on the top. But um, uh, what the, the, they contend is that uh, because the rocks contain stromatolites, which are sort of like algae fossils, um, and they believe that well, that was uh, before life started to be evolved. So this has to be Precambrian up here because of the uh, of the uh, of the stromatolites. And we've talked about that before. Uh, how they get a rock layer from is not based upon what the rocks composed of. It's what kind of fossils or lack thereof are found in it. Mm -hmm. That's usually what happens. And so you could have the same kind of rock. Uh, and you, you know, a layman would look at it and say, "Well, that's granite. That's granite, or that's that's sedimentary. This, or that's made up. So that's the same rock, but this has got triceratops in it, and this one's got got uh, coelacanths, or or not. Well, they're still alive, but how about uh, you know uh, some d uh, dimetrodons or something, or some fish? So that's got to be older. And in this case, Precambrian's got nothing. So that's the bedrock, mm -hmm. that, that, and it's on the very top. And it's separate. There's all kinds of you know, all kinds of strata that should even be in the middle there that, exactly. that, are, that are not there. Now, what you also find is that throughout the geologic column, from bottom to top, you find uh, marine fossils. So 95% of the fossils that you find in, in the rocks are, uh, are uh, things like clams. <laughs> Basically, yeah. and then 95% uh, uh, of the other remaining 5% are fish. Yeah. And then you have a, just a smattering of other kinds of fossils that you find. They use them for, uh, you know, like the different dinosaur types and uh, creatures that uh, wouldn't have uh, survived as long after the flood because of the, yeah. the you know, the in, entire environment was different. And so this, this character here... Uh, <laughs> you know, they may have been on the ark. They may have been able to uh, breed and last for some time, but uh, um, we wouldn't expect them to because uh, uh, lives uh, lives were much shorter. And uh, well, they were shorter, but they also, I think, they were hunted to some extent. But the conditions were bad. But it's like. Our, the history of the world, Doug, after the flood has been extinction. Mm, yeah, right, yeah. From dodo birds to passenger pigeons to, to we almost, uh, the buffalo was on, you know, bison here in America was almost made extinct by overhunting. Uh, but there's also environmental conditions. All of these are factors. The fact is, uh, we believe, yeah, dinosaurs were on the ark um, and that they were protected. Uh, not every kind of, di well, every kind of dinosaur, but not every species of dinosaur would have been necessarily be on there. That's another, uh, fee oh, you know, going in the weeds there right now. But point of it is, Doug, is that conditions, conditions uh, that they cause an overthrust like that, you know, a young earth on, or an old earth on top of young does not fit the uniformitarian Right. Our evolutionary time scale at all. You'd have okay. to have all kinds of tremendous force to uh, have have that. Uh, now, uh, mo many creationists still be believe that they there's this is a real overthrust where the uh, top layer moved over on top of the other layer. But uh, the problem with that is that you need all kinds of uh, uh, violent force in order to make that work. Uh, to have it go inch by inch over hundreds of years at a time, or thousands of years creeping up yeah. over on the top of it, that just doesn't make sense. Now, there's a another indication that of uh, the ore thrust, and uh, you can find examples of this in Smoky Mountains. Uh, there's a, the Great Smoky Fault uh, is Precambrian on top of Ordovician, and so you can find and there's. Uh, Cambrian missing in between. Okay, right. so there's a problem. Artificial is fish, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. And so that's the, the fish layer. Supposedly. And so there's Cades Cove, where you have a valley. The surrounding mountains are all Precambrian, but you see the uh, Ordovician in, uh, in the yeah, I, yeah, in the, the valley. valley yep. There's also uh, the Chilhowee Mountains, which are just north of the park, and there's a couple of valleys uh, in there called. Tuckalichi Cove and Ware Cove, where you you see the 
uh, out of order strata, but that's in a, what they call a window. And so you're seeing a window of the uh, of the younger rock underneath. And so that uh, that of course doesn't make sense. We will. Uh, you remember we went there. and We actually found some found of the, the spots. Yep, spots where where the it was out of order and. You know, and in many of these cases, the uh, contact between them are like a knife edge. And that uh, is really something that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, uh, people bring up that you see all these different layers and go to the Grand Canyon and uh, there they are. And uh, But the contacts between them are almost like a knife edge. You There's, should you know, see what what's called breccia or what is it breccia or what? Yeah, breccia, slicken size, um, fault gouge. You, you should see evidence of movement, and you're not seeing it in these yeah. places. Okay. But even in wh where you have the deposition uh, taking place, you would expect that if there were millions of years uh, taking place between the two layers, well, it would be a little unconsolidated, and you wouldn't be able to distinctly see the difference between the different what, layers. Like bioturbation? Bioturbation, yes, that's what it's called. Yeah, you should see evidence of of animal life or plant life, at least, or something mm -hmm. in some of those layers in between, mm -hmm. and you're not seeing any of it. Okay. And then you have uh, parallel strata, and this is what I'm just uh, talking about, parallel strata with smooth uh, contact line, lines. The uh, paraconformities is where you have a whole section of, uh, of uh, strata missing. Uh, yeah, like we just talked about, yep, okay. And the uh, one thing that Guy Forsyth uh, showed us out in um, Sedona is uh, seismites and piping. Seismites are where uh, the layers, when they after they were laid down, um, actually were jostled in an earthquake. And you can see where uh, where those uh, jagged uh, areas are because it uh, and it was a, just a uh, jog in, in the laying out down the layers. Piping is where you have uh, trapped water underneath. Uh, Finding its way up through oh yeah through holes in 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 the sandstone, but all of these things that you've talked about so far seems to indicate they had to be laid down by water action. Water action um, and uh, with successive tidal actions back and forth, back yeah. and forth, and even in one uh, uh, one session of that where you're uh, laying down the layers that lays it down in fine sedimentary layers. Now, evolutionists like to count all these and say each one of us a year. Is a year, yeah, yeah. yeah like, a, like a tree like ring. a tree ring. And uh, even with tree rings, you don't uh, can't the, really the, tell yeah. that uh, these are annual rings. Yeah. They do that in the ice cores. The ice cores, yeah. Yep. Uh, they do the annual rings, and yet uh, you, uh, there's a... World War II airplane buried in the Greenland ice sheet. Yeah, from uh, World War II. Yeah, and it was how many, how many, hundred, how many feet? It's just like yeah, it's the hundreds of feet underneath. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you, you can have uh, successive uh, snowstorms. Uh, the snowstorm itself will lay down all these different yep. finely graded layers. They call them, uh, you know, in the sandstone, they call them varves. Varves, that's, yeah. And, and, and so uh, counting all the varves is a favorite way to get the millions of years. However, you find that uh, the fish that are buried in the varves uh, are polystrate. And so you have uh, <laughs> all these different... Uh, 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 and explain, what is polystrate? What is polystrate? It means that they are... Um, uh, uh, extending through several different layers. Right, and each layer, if they're supposedly thousands or hundreds even, or hundreds of thousands, how does it go through melty layers? One fish, I, I don't know any fish that live 100,000 years old, you know, or right. even a thousand. Okay, but, that's uh, what you'd have to have. Okay, yeah, and so uh, and so, it's really a good indication that they were buried quickly. Yep. Uh, and Joggins uh, is an interesting area where uh, Larry and Perry and I went to visit uh, and with Ian Juby and yeah. Vance Nellis. That's one of the I missed out on. David yeah. Vanderheide, we were there. And yep. one of the things we saw there was uh, there was 18,000 feet of layers. And they're all tilted and sort of like stacked like uh, wow, okay. uh, yep. that way. Uh, and uh, th uh, in, in those layers, you can see uh, 
remnants of uh, fossil trees. And they're sticking up through the layers. Again, polished and they, Some of them are upside down, and some of them are sort of twisted around. And most and, of them, if I'm not, not mistaken, the roots are sheared off, their yes. roots are gone, yeah. And so what you have there is a good indication there was a violent action that took place that laid all these down in, in, in sequence. Right. And then the, the thing that is very interesting is that it's all sheared off at the top. Oh yeah. And so you have all these layers, but you're uh, you're is uh, sheared off the top, and and so this is in the area of the Bay of Fundy. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. And uh, when we were there, we saw the fifty foot tides come in and out. The, yeah, the, it, it actually goes comes in, it reverses mm -hmm. in direction for, and then it comes back. It's it's the only. Is I don't know. Is there any other place in the world that does that like that? I I don't know, but, but well, it's very there, famous. There are. Uh, Some other you know, spots? I think uh, Anchorage, Alaska, has an inlet like that. Do they? Where okay. They have really high tides like that. Okay. I I also found been researching Michigan's bedrock geology. Yeah, you were saying it has like an onion. Yeah, it was, like an onion. It, it was really interesting when I uh, saw the uh, DEQ's uh, bedrock geology map because it looks like uh, in the center of the of the map shows the oldest of the uh, of the strata that is in the bed bedrock is Jurassic. Okay. Uh, and then, I mean, the youngest of it would be the Jurassic, and then it gets older and older and older as it uh, Goes out. extends out uh, in the middle. And so it like, looks like a sliced onion. But that's uh, the thing I finally realized, is that this was all sliced off. Oh, okay. And so some event took place that sheared all this off. Now, you, you can maybe blame it on the glaciers, but I think that before the glaciers you had the the runoff of the flood that took place. Oh yeah, yeah. And then you know, what you had also was when glaciers came in, it took the parts that were uh, unconsolidated uh, and uh, where the uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron is, they uh, ground those out because they were... That's why we have, we have like moraines and, and eskers and all these different... Th right. they're, they're, there's evidence of what the glacial action does. But right. the stuff before that, like you talked about, would have been while when the when the land was still somewhat, I mean, still saturated with water. Okay, mm -hmm. and then it got it got cold fairly quickly, and and then the glacial action began. Now that that was a uh, fairly quickly, but not as quick as the flood the flood time. The, yeah, well, you, know, you have uh, happening after the flood is this uh, massive uh, uh, adjustment to the, the hydrological cycle. Right, right exactly. Because uh, the that would have taken the oceans, which have been much warmer because of the volcanic action. action. Now, uh, some critics say that the uh, you know the heat problem was so bad that uh, we, we couldn't uh, be able to. Uh, uh, it would have vaporized you could, you the could, ocean. Yeah, you could not have a worldwide flood because the, the mountains being raised up would have caused so much tectonic. It would have it would be so much heat. Everything in the oceans would have died. Now, what, what's the problem with that, Doug? Well, uh, you or can, what's the answer to that? I should say. The answer to that is actually you, you actually have. Uh, uh, the stratosphere as a heat sink. If you go up to the the height of uh, uh, of where the most of the airplanes fly, it's like sixty to get seven degrees below zero. Right, seventy degrees below so zero. So it's really cold up there. So when you have the va vaporized uh, ocean waters hit that, well, it's going to create this uh, massive uh, cycle of the uh, of condensation and the, the hydrologic cycle would be. Accelerated in a lot of respect, yeah. yeah. So you would have had, uh, had a big weather pattern for maybe, a, uh, I think Michael Ward estimates, took place over about 400 years. And so that's yeah. that's where you have, um, have quick frozen mammoths found in the Arctic, you know. The mammoths would have been, uh, you know, it would have been more of a temporary, temperate climate for a while. But uh, they would have been able to, uh, they would have been buried. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with these pictures of these woolly mammoths out this Arctic thing. But the fossil, the, the burials, they have buttercups in their stomach and mouths. This is this is uh, stuff that was in more of a temperate climate, not not anything that was highly frozen like the. And now that is, they're not 
totally encased in ice like maybe a lot of people think. Mm-hmm. It's more like frozen tundra. It's like right, right. muck. They were, you know, dumped on. This would have been probably that, like you say, when the when the 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 ground is along with the water is spewing up from the fountains of the deep. Mm-hmm. It hits the atmosphere and comes dumping back down, and, and it would have been highly frozen in a lot of these, especially in the northern Arctic ranges. But I, I think Doug, there's, I always wonder. There's an article about John Sarfati, and I'm, I, we won't we'll, won't spend a lot of time because you have a few more points you want to make here, which I think is kind of good. Yeah. But I think it's something we need to address. I think this was well written by Jonathan Sarfati, and it talks about we are telling you theories. We, there's creation models that have been developed, flood models. And he has an exa- he says model building should be an example of the ministerial use of science. In contrast, the magisterial use of science, practiced by all compromisers on Genesis, overrules the clear teaching of the Bible to come up with a meaning inconsistent with sound hermeneutics. In other words, the Bible said there was a worldwide flood. Yeah. Okay, and everything in Hebrew tells us it's a worldwide flood. He would never flood the world like that ever again. If it was local, then God's a liar. Yeah, and if so, it was local, he, uh, he would have just said, no, you go over here. Yeah, I could have done that. But I mean, but to say that he would never flood the world like that again indicates it was a one-time event. Mm-hmm. So anyway, the Bible, magisterial, the Bible trumps it. It's the overarching principle. And if we can find explanations, we create models, those are, and scientific ones. But they may be changed. Things could have. And we're working on the, that, that heat problem, which I think you kind of might be a solved, maybe glibly, maybe a little... We'll have to do a lot more research on it, yeah. but that, that that to me answers the questions that uh, the old earthers uh, and compromisers do that. So, Doug, before we got a couple more minutes left, we got a few more points. I'd like to get coal seams are buried thousands of feet deep. Yeah, oil you could drill down twelve thousand feet and get oil. Uh, you have uh, mountains are like the concave strata, uh, and then you have out of place fossils, out of place artifacts. And most fossils are recovered on the surface, regardless of the <laughs> absolutely of the, their supposed age. And so and that's that's the trouble is that you have uh, all this evidence. You know, you have uh, all these different things that the evolutionists won't consider, won't take a look at, and uh, they do it because not because they have problems with the, uh, uh, but they 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 just. Uh, have problems with the Bible. They don't. That's like a real the Bible. issue. Yeah, yeah and they, they probably have a little uh, bee in their bonnet because something happened to them that caused them to uh, be a little bit bitter against. Or God. they were taught an old earth thing when they were younger. They become a Christian, but they don't want to give up on the old earth. They want to be. They want to put their foot in both both camps, and that's not. That doesn't really help you much. You know, it really does not. You end up becoming inconsistent and losing respect in both camps, to be honest with the Christians and the evolutionists. Right, yeah. So um, those are the things I, I, I want to leave you with. It, it, the scripture is very clear. God created it in six days, rested on the seventh. There was a worldwide flood, and a lot of things were changed. Hydrologic cycle, the Ice Age comes probably around that time. All this stuff was going on, uh, but we have a lot of stuff empirical scientific things to show you the credibility of the flood model including some, I love it when you see the strata all twisted like all bumped up and bendy and all that kind of stuff, it's just amazing it had to be liquefied for that to do that you could not have millions of years dug of doing of having a bend like that You know, the, the strata, that it looks like something like taffy was pulled you know what I'm saying, sometimes it's just amazing So uh, I hope you enjoyed our show tonight. Uh, We'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution.